Hi friends, welcome to my YouTube channel Dr. Srinivas Medical Concepts. I am Dr. Srinivas, Neurophysician from Andhra Pradesh, India. I am also the medical author of the book Focused Neurology. Today we will talk about tremor and hyperkinetic movement disorders. It's a very broad topic and therefore I will be touching upon only the medical concepts, important concepts. So how do we approach an involuntary movement? Basically an involuntary movement could be a hypokinetic movement, a decrease in the kinesia, classic example is Parkinson's disease or excessive movements, hyperkinetic movement disorder, classic example is tremor. The hypokinetic movement disorder and Parkinson's I've already covered in the last class. So today I'll be talking about tremors and hyperkinetic movement disorders. So what is tremor? Tremor has got alternate contraction of agonist and antagonist. Unlike dystonia, which is a co-contraction of agonist and antagonist. Second, it is rhythmic. Unlike myoclonus, which is arrhythmic. So it has a contraction of agonist and antagonist. It is rhythmic. It is oscillatory in time. That is tremor. So contraction, alternate contraction of agonist and antagonist, rhythmic and oscillatory. Generally, physiological tremors, the frequency is high, about 10 hertz, whereas pathological tremor, the frequency is only 5 hertz. So now, how do we approach a case of tremor? Tremor approach is broadly divided into resting tremor or an action tremor. The classic example for resting tremor is Parkinson's disease. As the name suggests, it occurs during rest. So classically, it's a pill rolling type of movement. As with the pharmaceutical persons who make pills. So it's a thumb which moves upon the first few fingers, especially the first two fingers. So it's a pill rolling movement. So it's a resting tremor. The classic example is Parkinson's. The moment they start moving, the moment the action comes, the resting tremor completely disappears. This is a classic feature of Parkinson's disease. Action tremor, again you can divide it into intention, that is goal directed sequence. When it comes as a goal directed sequence, intention tremor, the tremor increases. The classic example is cerebellar tremor. The second kind of action tremor is a postural tremor. You ask them to outstretch their hands against the gravity. So this could be a physiological tremor, which is an enhanced tremor, usually seen in conditions where there's, a, there's an increase in adrenaline, like thyrotoxicosis, caffeine. So this is a physiological tremor. We have also the essential tremor, which is usually asymmetrical to begin with, and then it becomes symmetrical. In fact, essential tremor is the most common tremor or most common movement disorder, which we come across. So essential tremor, ask him to keep his hands outstretched against the gravity and you can see the nice tremor. Essential tremor is familial and, and as the action increases, the tremor also increases. So one important point by which essential tremor can be differentiated by Parkinson's tremor from Parkinson's tremor is asking them to take a cup of coffee or anything and start drinking. Parkinson's tremor, it is present at rest, but the moment the action is initiated, it disappears. So they can drink a cup of uh, a glass full of water. But essential tremor, it is present in Portugal, but action, it does not make the tremor disappear. In fact, the tremor may accentuate and therefore when they start sipping water, it starts falling. So this is one way by which you can differentiate essential tremor from Parkinson's tremor. So essential tremor is familial. And uh, surprising is it decreases with alcohol. So, and what is the treatment for essential tremor? We give beta blockers and alcohol. So, these are this is the way we approach a person suffering from tremor: a resting tremor, an action tremor, one which could be a goal-oriented. Second is on posture. Right. Next, we we go to another hyperkinetic disorder, dystonia. Here, before I talk about dystonia, I need to introduce a good uh, one concept. This is known as Sherrington's law of reciprocal innervation. What does this law say? Sherrington's law of reciprocal innervation. For a movement to be performed, agonist should contract and antagonist should relax. So agonist should contract and antagonist should relax. For, for example, if I need to lift dumbbells, 
my bicep should contract and tricep should relax. If both contract, it will be in midway. I cannot perform a movement. So there will be a when there is a contraction of agonist, there is a relaxation of antagonist. This is the normal phenomenon. So generally, there is no co-contraction of agonist and antagonist. If there is a co-contraction of agonist and antagonist, it becomes dystonia. The only physiological conditions where there could be a contraction of both agonist and antagonist is standing. When both agonist and antagonist contract and shivering. Other than these, it becomes abnormal. So when there is a co-contraction of agonist and antagonist, we call it as dystonia. Another important feature of dystonia is that it is patterned. That means it does not go from one muscle group to the another muscle group. It stays in the same muscle group, unlike chorea, which is fleeting in time. So this is another feature. And then they have sensory tricks. What is sensory tricks? For example, a person is having cervical dystonia. If they keep their hands on the neck like this, the tremor is, is the dystonia slowly starts coming down. These are known as sensory tricks. So, so much so that sometimes the persons may develop neuropathies, compressive neuropathies by keeping like this. So they have sensory tricks. It's a co-contraction of agonist and antagonist and pattern where it affects the same muscle groups. So classification is that the broad classification of dystonia is generalized, which is usually genetic and focal. Focal again could be isolation where the myo where the dystonia is the prominent feature. Example, cervical dystonia which you find it in 50% and blepharospasm which you find it in 20%. Blepharospasm is the eye blinking. It can be sometimes confused with a hemifacial spasm where there is also eye blinking. But the way to differentiate is hemifacial spasm as the name implies it's on one side. So only one eyelid starts blinking whereas blepharospasm both eyelids start blinking. Then you have combined. Combined is that Myoclonus is a predominant feature, but there are other diseases also. Example, as it is associated with Parkinson's disease, what we call as dopa responsive dystonia, and it is very much sensitive to dopaminergic drugs. And second is the complex dystonia, where dystonia is one part of the many components of the disease. Example, Wilson's disease and drug induced disorders. So the treatment is, it depends upon the cause. Suppose if it is dopa responsive dystonia, it is very much uh, treatable condition. It is very much sensitive to levodopa. And then you can give baclofen, you can give anticholinergic drugs, you can tetrabenazin, you can in Wilson's disease, you give penicillin and zinc, you can give botox, botulinum, and then you can give, you can do deep brain stimulation. Right. Now we'll come to another interesting hyperkinetic disorder, chorea. Chorea, it is irregular. Unlike tremor, which is regular, chorea is irregular. And second thing is that it is non-patterned. That means it is fleeting in time. Unlike the dystonia, which is patterned and gives rise to all kinds of uh, postural disturbances, it is fleeting in time, semi-purposive, and there can be a milkmaid grip. Suppose we ask the person to hold on the hands of the examiner, they start taking away fingers like this as if they are taking out the milk. So milk made grip and uh, the chorea usually the lesion is in the caudate nucleus. It is seen in the frontal horns of the under the frontal horns of the lateral ventricle and therefore when the chorea when the caudate nucleus gets atrophied the lateral ventricles bulge like this what you call it as a square shaped lateral ventricles which you see on imaging. The treatment includes tetrabenazine, the hunting tense chorea another important entity of chorea is hunting tense chorea which is a triad, they have dementia, they have cognitive disturbances and it is usually familial, autosomal dominant. And uh, usually it's a, it's a trinucleotide repeat disorder and it is usually more than 40. And one interesting mechanism here is anticipation. What is anticipation? The disease tends to become worse in successive generations because of the trinucleotide repeat numbers change. So it worsens in successive generations. That is anticipation. Then you have others like Sydenham's chorea, which you see in pregnancy. You have non-ketotic hyperglycemia. You can see in SLE. You can see in antiphospholipid antibody syndromes. You can see in hyperthyroidism. You can see in neuroacanthocytosis. So this is about chorea. Next we will talk about any balismus. 
Hemi talismus is similar to chorea but it is more wild, flinging type, violent form of chorea. The lesion is in the subthalamus and then you can see it in non-ketotic hyperglycemia and uh, the treatment is dopamine blocking drugs. Then we have ticks. So far I have been discussing all these involuntary movements. They are completely involuntary. But here ticks is that there is some amount of awareness to them. So they are some, somehow they are to some extent they are aware of what is going on. So these are ticks otherwise known as habit spasms. So there is some degree of awareness. They have a recurrence and it is a stereotype. They can have motor and vocal tone, vocal ticks motor and vocal ticks for example you know adjusting the shirt or clearing the throat these are all common forms of blinking these are all common forms of motor ticks sometimes they can have vocal ticks also they keep talking sometimes coprolalia they can talk vulgar language what you see in gillis dela tourette syndrome so which is called as coprolalia and the treatment is alpha gonistronidin so they can have repetitive blinking then we will talk about myoclonus. Myoclonus is very very brief. It is brief, sudden, shock like muscle contractions. This is myoclonus. And here we have a negative form of myoclonus where there is a relaxation in between the muscular contraction which is called as a negative myoclonus. How do you test this negative myoclonus? What you call as asterisks. It is like stopping the traffic. It is like policemen stopping the traffic. So you ask them to extend their hands and abduct the fingers and you can see nice flapping tremor. Again, it is not rhythmic. It is arrhythmic. If this is present asterisks, it usually indicates a metabolic encephalopathy, usually hepatic encephalopathy. And usually they are symmetrical. The causes is hypoxia. Hypoxia is very important cause of myoclonus. Hypoxic encephalopathy gives rise to myoclonus and generally we see myoclonus associated with epilepsies also like juvenile myoclonic epilepsy, West syndrome and uh, progressive myoclonic encephalopathies. We see in other conditions, metabolic conditions like uh, uh, we see it in hepatic encephalopathy, we see in subacute sclerosing, panencephalitis, we see in Kruzfeld jacob disease and uh, uh, opsoclonus and myoclonus combination can occur in neuroblastomas. Then we have another important entity known as palatal myoclonus which is other involuntary movements usually disappear in sleep but palatal myoclonus is an exception it is present even in sleep. So the palatal myoclonus usually the lesion is in the Gulen molara triangle where you have the red nucleus involvement, inferior olive nucleus in involvement and the dentate nucleus involvement. So if you find in this triad it can give rise to a myoclonus known as palatal myoclonus. Right. Now we will go to another entity drug induced kinesias. So drugs can itself can cause uh, hyperkinetic movements dyskinesias. So usually these are neuroleptics, anti-psychiatric drugs especially the uh, the, the typical antipsychotic, the older generation psychotic drugs and even, even drugs which we use in our general routine gastrointestinal disorders like metaclopramide. So these deplete dopamine and then can cause these uh, drug induced uh, uh, dyskinesias. Basically there are three types, acute, subacute and chronic. Acute is that it occurs within minutes, within minutes of giving these antipsychotic drugs they, they develop. These are known as acute dystonias. So they occur within minutes. The treatment is that you give promethazine 25 to 50 milligrams IM bar IV. You can give diazepam, you can give anticholinergic drugs. You can give baclofen. The subacute variety it causes akathisia. Here it appears after few few days to few weeks. Akathisias. Here there are they have motor restlessness, and it takes hours to days, and then. If you give antipsychotics on a long term basis, chronic months to years, they can develop tardive syndromes. Here also they can have the hyperkinetic movements, antipsychotics, usually we give uh, valproate and clonazepam and, and typical antipsychotics cause, so, so we can slowly replace by atypical antipsychotics like clozapine. Right. 
Then we have another uh, entity known as neuroleptic malignant syndrome. So when you, when you give dopamine depleting agents, it can cause an acute dopamine deficiency and can cause neuroleptic malignant syndrome. So what are the features? Gen they generally present with high fever, they will have muscle rigidity, increased creatinine kinase, the pulse rate is increased, there is labile blood pressure, there are renal parameters which get affected. So all these features, if uh, the constellation of features, you call it as neuroleptic malignant syndrome and therefore it's, it's, uh, the mortality is very high and therefore we have to be very very careful. We have to shift them to ICU where there is air condition, bring down the temperature. We can give dantolin, we have to give dopaminergic like drugs like bromocryptin or in a rescue measure we can give apomorphin, dopamine agonistic drugs, apomorphin or, or, or the pramipexone. We will give valproate and clonazepam also. Right. And then uh, a similar disorder like neuroleptic malignant syndrome is serotonin syndrome. How do you differentiate serotonin syndrome? Serotonin syndrome is basically because of the increase in serotonin, serotonergic drugs like tryptophan. So the main differentiating point would be myoclonus. Myoclonus is usually seen in serotonin syndrome unlike the neuroleptic malignant syndrome. So here we give kiproheptadine as a treatment. Then another interesting hyperkinetic disorder what we have is paroxysmal dyskinesias. Paroxysmal as the name suggests it is not continuous it, it comes and then goes. So again there are three types one is which occurs on activity one on non-activity one with exercise. The one which comes with the with the movement which is triggered by movement we call as PKD paroxysmal kinesogenic dyskinesias and the treatment we give is anti-epileptic drugs like phenyton and carbamazepine. So some have suggested that it could be because of an epileptic uh, disorder, but still we are not sure about the uh, etiopathogenesis. Then we have a paroxysmal non kinesogenic dyskinesias. They are caused by taking alcohol or caffeine and then the treatment is tetrabenazin and clona clonazepine. Then we have the paroxysmal Exertional dyskinesia, these are triggered by exercise and the treatment is ketogenic diet. Right. Now we have another interesting entity which is known as restless leg syndrome. We have basically the four core features. They have an urge to move the legs and if the if they take rest, the movement the becomes exact the it, it aggravates, but once they start moving, it comes down and it is usually increased uh, in the night. So this is known as restless leg syndrome. Basically, the pathogenesis could be genetic because of dopamine alteration, so we give uh, dopaminergic drugs. But sometimes it is seen in iron deficiency anemia also, so we give uh, iron also as replacement. Then we have the Parkinson's disease with the hyperkinetic movement disorders. The classic example is Wilson's disease. So Parkinsonism with hyperkinetic movement disorders, the classic example is Wilson's disease. Here the pathogenesis is because of decrease in seroloplasmin. Seroloplasmin is the substance which, which allows the calcium. Yeah. Which sorry, which allows the transfer of the copper, which allows the transfer of copper to the copper containing enzymes like cytochrome oxidase. And therefore, when the celluloplasmin is decreased, the cytochrome oxidase also becomes dysfunctional and it affects the other systems. So, Wilson disease basically they have manifestations of liver, they will have the manifestations of the brain and usually we find the KF ring. So, the treatment includes penicillamine and giving zinc. Then we have non-degenerative disorder of the brain with the brain iron accumulation. Here we have the iron accumulation in the basal ganglia and the classic uh, radiological feature is the eye of the tiger sign. Then a lot of psychiatrists and sometimes neurologists also have this difficulty when they encounter uh, a hyperkinetic movement disorder which could be functional or psychogenic. So how do we differentiate whether it's a functional psychogenic disorder from organic disorder? One, they have variability. It does not stick to a particular pattern. It keeps varying. And second, distractibility. The moment someone is not watching, it decreases. Someone who watches, it starts increasing. So variability and distractibility. Third is that they have an entrainment phenomenon. What is entrainment? Suppose they have a tremor about five, uh, about ten hertz, and then we ask them to do uh, elicit the tremor of similar kind, but it may be of three hertz. So what do they? They they, they try to reduce this and try to catch up with it, the same frequency of the tremor of the opposite side. So they have entrainment. And another feature is that tremors normally. 
as the amplitude increases the frequency decreases so as the amplitude increases the frequency decreases it is it is it is not it is inversely proportional but here in function disorders the amplitude also starts increasing the frequency also starts increasing so this is a function moment disorder so this is how we differentiate the functional disorders from the a real organic hypercandic moment disorders i have enjoyed giving the lecture i hope you also enjoyed uh, listening to this lecture if you have liked it please like and subscribe my youtube channel dr srinivas medical concepts and my fb page dr srinivas concepts thank you bye